morning everyone today our top topic of discussion is neuromuscular junction diseases and um, as you know we are going in this sequence like we started from the cerebellum then we came on to the cere cerebrum and then we came to the cerebellum and the brain stem then the spinal cord then we talk about the peripheral nerves and now the peripheral nerves when they go and innervate the muscles we call it as neuromuscular junction right now one important thing to tell you here is um, again guyton or physiology you know in physiology you will found a full function or full physiology about the neuromuscular junction how the impulses are transmitted uh, to the muscles right so here again like I'm, I'm just showing you a simple neuromuscular junction in which the neurotransmitters you know they are there and then there are certain mito mitochondria of course like this is the axon they are showing you and this one is the motor end plate and this is the skeletal nerve muscle fibers and what's going on here is like you know uh, there is acetylcholine which is released and then there is acetylcholine receptors over here which catch them and then there is acetylcholine esterase which basically break down that so uh, in simple words guys you know very 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 important to uh, know the normal physiology of the muscles or the neuromuscular junction or the synapse right so here of course like in Guyton of course they did not explain in so much detail but this one is like how acetylcholine receptor looks like okay so anyhow uh, we are going to study now um, conditions my senior gravis uh, I will talk a little about E. Atten Lambert syndrome and there is one more thing called as you know there are certain neurotoxins like which are present in the black widow which enhances acetylcholine release and there is botulinum toxin botulinum toxin you know nowadays there is botus injection which block the acetylcholine release and then there is alpha bungarotoxin which bind to the acetylcholine receptor so anyhow uh, of course we are not going to discuss all these things in detail but what is the thing uh, this one is like the black widow spider which you can see over here and this is again the same photograph in which like they are showing the botulinum is doing what uh, stopping this one black widow do what uh, Lambert Eaton do what and my senior grave is do what so simply um, explanation of that but uh, what we are going to study um, in this lecture is like of course my senior gravis right uh, now you can see like a female 25 years of age a drooping of the right eyelid uh, you can see over here and double vision for two meters past history is hypothyroidism and physical examination is total stosis on the right side pupils are normal liberation of the abduction of the eyeball uh, visual acuity and fundus are normal uh, treatment like intramuscular injection of some medication and prognosis complete remission after 20 minutes recurrence after 60 minutes anyhow like this is just a scenario uh, to tell you how the condition looks like we will go on discussing myasthenia gravis okay um, uh, talking about the myasthenia gravis uh, uh, what is the definition first of all uh, of myasthenia gravis okay um, my senior gravis is a rare clinical disease what I will write down is the definition which is very important it's defined as progressive autoimmune now see autoimmune word is self-explanatory right so of course like there are autoantibodies in this one disorder <clears throat> due to anti acetylcholine receptor or 
anti M U S K antibodies, right? So these are basically two types of antibodies which are present. Okay, but we have to you have to remember this one. This one is the important one. Okay, very 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 important. So when these antibodies are present, so which are anti acetylcholine receptor antibodies, so the antibodies are binding the receptors. Okay, so what happens due to this binding? It results in or resulting in early saturation at the neuromuscular junction and inadequate uh, muscle activation with increasing nerve stimulation. You know, this one is quite comprehensive definition, guys. And if you can understand this definition, remember this definition, the thing is easy. Um, to tell you, see. Acetylcholine is released. They go and attach to the receptors. And muscle contraction, at contraction occurs. Now here, there are antibodies which are anti acetylcholine esterase antibodies, right? So when they are there, what is going on? There will be re less receptors over there, right? And when there will be less receptors, what will happen? Like the receptors, the remaining receptors will become saturated easily or quickly, okay? Like, you know, the acetylcholine is synthesized here in the motor nerve terminal. And they are stored in the vesicles and whenever the action potential it reaches over here what happens like with each action potential 150 to 200 vesicles they released and they combine here with the acetylcholine esterase receptors choline acetylcholine receptors now uh, as you know I was showing you here this receptor guys so it consists of five subunits you know one two three four five 2 alpha, uh, 1 beta, 1 gamma, 1 sigma. Anyhow, so <laughs> what happens? The acetylcholine, uh, choline, uh, it binds with this receptor, okay, and then this one open. And when this one opens, it permits the cations to go inside, which is chiefly sodiums which causes a depolarization and um, simply uh, you can open the guide and you can read like then how what happens like simply uh, uh, muscle contraction started like you know actin and myosin and all this stuff right now this process like see they are showing the release of this thing this one is quickly uh, stopped by acetylcholine rays, which basically um, dissolve whatever acetylcholine is present over here, right? So what is happening in Mycenae gravis, because there is decrease in the number of acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptors here on the muscle end, what will happen that there is decreased efficiency of neuromuscular transmission, okay? So therefore, whatever acetylcholine is released normally, it produces a small end plate potential okay so that's why they have weakness of muscle contraction now when they have weakness of muscle contraction so of course repeatedly like on repeated stimulus they keep on releasing more and more and more acetylcholine per impulse like 150 to 200 I told you right already so what happens like simply due to these things the people because they have less receptors over here so with increased action potentials their acetylcholine get exhausted and that's why they had the weakness or the muscle fatigue okay so that's why on repeated Impulses, they have weakened and weakened and weakened contraction. Okay. So, 
Now, what is the abnormality? There are autoantibodies, which are anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, which are binding over here on, on these sides. Okay. So this is how, uh, what is what you can say, the pathophysiology of this condition. So uh, other one, which I told you in uh, less of the patients, you know, uh, uh, what you can say, um, anti-MUSK or anti-muscle specific kinase is also there. It also resulted in myasthenia gravis, but in very few people, like simply there is an immune response uh, to muscle specific kinase due to that antibodies and that they, 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 call, they, they did do all the damage. So uh, remember guys, now again, we will go on to the definition and uh, I will show you the definition. It's a progressive autoimmune disorder due to anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies resulting in early saturation of the neuromuscular junction and inadequate muscle activation with increasing nerve stimulation, right? Uh, if you understand this thing now, the things will be easy for you guys. Many of the patients, you know, okay, what is the, okay, this one have bimodal uh, age of onset you can say first of all in 20s and mostly in females and later in 60s mostly in men okay so incidence is five bimodal age of onset okay uh, you can say simply 20s in men and sorry in, in females okay and 60s in men okay this is like how it present so now like again they are showing you the same thing like you know the nerve and the muscle and what is going on uh, here the antibody is holding see few of the muscles uh, receptors so see just one is there right so here three are here here one is here so, okay, leave this animal models because we are not going to discuss this animal, animal models over here. Rather, we will go on to um, the clinical findings, right? So, remember guys, one of the clinical findings is I told you that uh, uh, whenever like someone have clinical, what you can say, one autoimmune disease, you know, they are prone to get more autoimmune diseases. 15% um, of the patients who have multiple uh, myasthenia gravis, you know, they have thymic neoplasia as well. And 50% of the patients, they have hyperplasia of the thymus, thymus gland, you know, which is, you can say, under your sternum, above, like. So now, uh, <coughs> what happens, like, what if we will talk about the clinical features, Overall, women, they are more affected than men. The ratio is around 3 ratio 2. And the main feature of mycenia gravis is basically weakness and fatigue, fatigability of the muscles. And the weakness, it increases during repeated use. So, when, for example, you are going to make a fist and then open the hands and then make a fist, open the hands. So, you can do it as many as time as you want, but these patients with repeatedly closing, making the fist and opening it, they may they have weakness in the power. And once you will give your muscles a rest for a rest for a while, then again the power come back, but again then on repeated usage it goes less and less and less. So now, the patients, they present with ocular ptosis, see, the muscles are drooped, the eyes, lids are drooped, as well as diplopia. Why? Because these are, like, and this one, when they wake up in the morning, it, it's not there, but towards the afternoon or in the evening, they have this type of expression, okay? So simply... The lids and the extraocular muscles, they have diplopia and ptosis, okay, which is the common initial complaint. 
and the facial witness produced a snarling expression. Snarling expression. Okay. This is how they they look like during towards the afternoon or towards the evenings. Now see, one thing is eating also. When they eat, when they chew, okay? So with chewing meat, for example, if you'll give them meat, you know, they have to chew it. So what happens, like, you know, they, it like the, the there is weakness while, with chewing, okay? So in the start, they will be fine, but while chewing, they will become weak, weak, and weaker, or the muscle become fatigued. And there will be difficulty in swallowing as well because of the weakness of the palate, tongue, and the pharynx. Okay. So, simply, they have fatigable, symmetric, or asymmetric weakness without reflex changes, guys. The reflex will be normal. So, ocular, I told you. Bulbar, dysphagia, dysarthria, I told you. There will be proximal, this is chewing, sorry. So snarling expression, I told you. Muscles neck weakness or proximal muscle weakness. Difficulty raising head, okay. And extremities and trunks will be affected, right? And remember guys, these symptoms are exaggerated or exacerbated by infections, pregnancy, menses, and by the use of drugs. And the respiratory muscle weakness can lead to respiratory failure, breathing crisis. Okay. So this is how these patients they present. So now, how the disease goes guys, you know, the disease have variable course, you know. For example, there are exacerbations and remissions, exacerbations and remissions, exacerbations and remissions. And remissions are not complete or permanent. And that's how all the auto autoimmune conditions they they present or they behave simply. Now there could be cardiac abnormality and they they have like I told you thymus hyperplasia is there and they present with other autoimmune conditions. Now how we diagnose? We should look for the symptoms and signs, we check for the fatigability. We do some drug tests, we can do immunological studies, we can do electromyographic studies, and we can do investigation for coexistence. Like investigations to look for other autoimmune conditions. Uh, you can see over here a fatigue phenomena, which they are showing you over here. So simply, uh, for example, if you will ask the patient to keep on looking upward like this, so what will happen? See, uh, a normal person will keep on looking like this, but they what happens like see they become fatigued and their eyes they have ptosis okay so this is very important and a very 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 typical feature to diagnose this condition is of course you will take the history and you will do the examination in the examination remember there will be no loss of reflexes or impairment of sensations okay so this is how they present well. Now to diagnose or, or to do the test, you know, we can do a tensilon test and we can do or we can do a neostigmine test. What is a tensilon test? You know, tensilon is basically uh, uh, we give them adrophonium chloride. So we give them tensilon is what it is basically. Um, Adrophonium chloride. Okay. So 
what this drug is basically it is a short acting anti cholinesterase which is going to destroy what cholinesterase or simply it will make available more and more acetylcholine at the receptor right so what happens like uh, because this drug prolongs the action of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction for few minutes when we give them this drug by IV, IV injection. So what we see when we give tensilone or androphonium chloride to these patients, simply it is going to, it's a short acting anticholinesterase, okay, short acting anticholinesterase. So what will happen like whenever we give this one it is if the test is positive if there is marked improvement okay there will be marked improvement so this is how we why we do we give this drug and simply if you know what is acetylcholinesterase and what is anti acetylcholinesterase okay so simply when they feel improvement in power, we say, okay, this is the tensile test is positive. Neosigmine test, guys, again, this is uh, working on the same, what you can say, uh, what you can say, same um, thing like tensile, okay? And uh, simply, we can give them uh, this neostigmine, okay, uh, plus atropine, and observe. We observe for 15 minutes, okay. Uh, positive if there is marked improvement. So see, like before and after we give, okay. So, uh, so some patients still respond to neostigmine well, although no to tensilon. We give them atropine just to counter the side effects of the heart, right? So, like this is like how we do, um, like the test for this one, Mycenae gravis. And what is the difference between guys tensilon and neostigmine? Like remember, neostigmine is a long, longer acting drug. Okay, tensilon is a shorter acting drug. And of course, like other than that, you we can look for acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Okay, so we can just take the serum of the patient and we can send it to the labs and they can check and they can found that the patient have acetylcholine nesterase uh, receptor antibodies okay so it have a good sensitivity and if this one is negative of course like you can check for um, anti uh, musk antibodies as well okay um, other than that you know what tests we can do is like uh, something we call it call as electromyographic studies so see like what is this one is electromyographic study what they do like uh, they uh, record the muscle action potential you know they keep on uh, passing the impulse and you can see it it uh, record the impulse okay so uh, what they do like uh, simply uh, they keep on repeatedly st give stimulation okay and they can they keep on repeating like uh, and like noticing the response and see in the start the response was high but on repeated simulation see this one is bigger smaller 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 right so it's it, we call it as decremental response okay so my senior gravis show show what my senior gravis shows decremental response so single fi fiber uh, electromyography can also be done in these patients okay so um, like of course these studies are helpful uh, in the patients okay so simply we can do this uh, history examination we can do tensilon test we can do neosigmine test we can do uh, antibodies test we can do emgs so we can do EMGs or electromyographic studies 
and we can do CT scan. This is a single fiber EMG, see, we call it as myasthenic jitter. Uh, like uh, this one is like, you know, when we give them one simulation, so they give this kind of response, it is called as what, myasthenic jitter. And one of the thing, you know, we can do CT, CT scan or MRI to see for thymus hyperplasia. See, the thymus gland is too much big, right? And of course, we can do um, investigation to look for other autoimmune conditions like for systemic lupus erythematosus, for other conditions, for systemic sclerosis, and there are many other conditions which are autoimmune. So, now guys, uh, um, in differential diagnosis, you can see atrial Lambert syndrome. I will talk about that in a while. Uh, how we treat these patients now? This is important, right? So how we treat um, these patients? So the management. Uh, I should remove this one because, okay. Uh, the important thing over here is uh, uh, like uh, in the treatment for these patients rather I would I would like to talk about myself here how we, how we manage or treat the patients okay what is the treatment in my senior gravis it's simply uh, you know one thing is symptomatic relief right what is symptomatic relief of course we will give, give some drugs and uh, that drugs uh, are going to um, give some symptomatic improvement like tensilone or neostigmine, right? So, we can do this thing. Number one, we can do this thing. Number second, if someone have thymus hyperplasia, of course, we can treat that, right? So, in the start, like I would like to talk about that, you know, Thymectomy. Thymectomy. When we remove the thymus, 85% of the patients, you know, show improvement or remission. Okay. So this is a very, very, very important thing. Other than that, you know, we will talk about the symptomatic relief, right? So in symptomatic relief, guys, what, what we can do? See, we can do acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. We have to increase acetylcholine over there. So we can do a drug, give a drug like pyridostigmine. Uh, okay. So it is like, like a sim symptomatic relief or symptomatic relief. It's autoimmune condition. We can suppress the immunity or we can put the patient on immunosuppression. And in that case, you know, whenever someone have exacerbation of the condition, you know, steroids um, are the mainstay of treatment in that patient. Okay. So, uh, if the patient, they, can, they cannot uh, take the steroids, then we can give the other drugs, which are immunosuppressive drugs, like as a um, thioprene or, uh, for example, cyclophosphamide. Okay. Like, or if the patient, for example, they cannot take steroids at all, so we can give this one. And uh, if, for example, someone is going into crisis, you know, I told you respiratory crisis or breathing crisis, or because like they cannot breathe, so in that case, or we can say for crisis management, uh, we can put the patient on intravenous immunoglobulins or plasma pheresis, right? So Plasma pheresis is like the thing we can do. So now uh, the important thing, see, we can give them acetylcholine esterase medications, which provide symptomatic relief, and pyridostigmine is the most widely used drugs drug in this one. Whenever the patient take, you know, it takes like around 15 to 30 minutes for this action to start, and it lasts for three to four hours. So that's why it is given three to four times daily on in divided dosages. Okay. So this thing is important. Now, 
uh, thymectomy, I told you. People, they show remission, 85% of the patient, they, they show good results. And of course, immunosuppression. It's autoimmune condition, you have to suppress the immunity. So steroids or steroid sparing drugs, mycophenolate can also be given. So all these things can be done, given. Um, other than this, guys, uh, plasma phoresis and intravenous immunoglobulins for the crisis management. So now, of course, like, you know, what is plasma phoresis? Like they, they are going to exchange the plasma. Plasma is the one which have the antibodies. And of course, they, they will remove that. Okay. So, of course, these are used in the patients for rapid improvement, simply. Or, for example, someone who have respiratory weakness. And as I told you, that, you know, the symptoms are exaggerated by pregnancy, by infections, by menses, by drugs. So, people, when they have go in that thing, you know, the symptoms are exaggerated. We can put the patient on this thing. So, of course, like whenever someone goes into myasthenic crisis or there is exacerbation of the symptoms, so, of course, like, you know, they can, it can, it can be fatal, it can kill the patient by, because, you know, the patient, they have intercostal muscle weakness or diaphragmatic weakness, they cannot breathe. So, of course, this patient should be admitted into the ICUs and uh, we, what you can say, uh, well, like we start this management, okay, just like in the emergencies, of course, like uh, to save the patient from this condition. So this is like uh, uh, my senior gravis, okay, and uh, one thing which I wanted to discuss about is called as um, E. Atten Lambert syndrome. Now, what is Yatin-Lambert syndrome, guys? It's a very interesting type of condition. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> what happens in this condition is Yatin-Lambert syndrome, which is a uh, which 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 is coming as a differential diagnosis of myasthenia gravis, you know. This one is associated with small cell lung carcinoma of in the patients who have this carcinoma so in this carcinoma they basically produce odd antibodies and now the antibodies they are produced against here there are calcium channels okay here they are calcium channels so they produce antibodies against the presynaptic this is a presynaptic right voltage gated calcium channels so the antibodies, they come and they are attached to the voltage gated calcium channels which are present over here. These antibodies they are attached to this place. Okay. So what happens that uh, whenever like someone who have uh, antibodies which are attached to the calcium channels or the voltage gated cal calcium channels over here. What happens is, when they will try to do some movement, so the antibodies that are blocking the calcium channels, very little acetylcholine will be released. But on repeated, what you can say, impulses, someone who is trying to do some repeated movements, with each new nerve stimulus, or what you can say, is, uh, action potential, or the nerve uh, nerve impulse what will happen that there will be more and more and more acetylcholine will be released in this place so there will be a time that there will be enough acetylcholine over here to cause the contraction okay so what what's going on is simply these this is a syndrome in which there is There is antibodies against presynaptic 
voltage gated calcium channels okay so of course it will cause less release of acetylcholine but on repeated movement or repeated tries what will happen more and more and more acetylcholine will be released okay so of course like they it also causes weakness to the skeletal muscles but no sensory or coordination abnormalities and the legs are commonly affected as well as the proximal legs are commonly affected plus proximal muscles proximal muscles are commonly affected okay even in my senior gravis it's the proximal muscles which are commonly affected right so same like this one proximal muscles are commonly affected so but there will be you know one thing which you have to remember like the differences in this one and that one like the reflexes reflexes are absent in this case why because when you will check the reflex you know there will be no movement if you'll keep on checking reflexes the reflex will start coming back okay so and also they have more anticholinergic symptoms like dry mouth impotence constipation things like this okay and we do when we do tensile on tests in this one of course they don't show any response but one very important thing is what when we do emg okay emg electromyography okay so what we do we give them rapid repetitive repetitive stimulation and what happens like they show like I mean, my senior gravis they show dec decremental response but in this one they show incremental response in the start the movement the uh, contraction is less but as you will keep on providing more and more and more uh, action potentials you know the, the, the power will come back as normal so anyone who is diagnosed with the uh, yet Lambert syndrome guys always if they are not diagnosed can uh, case of lung cancer screen them for the for the lung cancer okay and of course like in this case uh, what will be the treatment of course treat the tumor remove the tumor okay 